Welcome to another installment of Friday q and I hope you're all doing really well. As always, thank you so much for this week's questions. You can put questions you would like me to answer in the comments below, and I will do my best to answer them in next week's video. If you want to support the channel, there are links in the video description to my music and my Patreon. If you want to jump on the Discord and have a chat about guitars, coffee, cats, anything you like, there is a link in the video description as well. Let's go with this week's questions. First one is from Apakep, who noticed that there was a new song in my intro. I put up a pinned comment in last week's Q&A asking to see if anybody recognized what it was from, and a bunch of you recognized that it was a Go West song. Uh, well done, I was just kind of fooling around with that riff, and I was like, this would make awesome intro music. So that's why I did it. And uh, you probably would have noticed that this week just kind of resumed regular service on that one. But the question is, uh, is a new single or album coming out soon? Uh, so that was just an intro track, nothing to do with anything we've got in the works with the band. Uh, nothing planned with the album just yet, but at uh, the start of April, there will be a tasty little thing up. You'll probably see it on the channel, or you can go and subscribe to the Ragdoll YouTube channel and check it out there, or look us up on Instagram and Facebook or on your favorite streaming service. So keep your eyes open for that one. That is going to be a whole bunch of fun. So thank you for that question. Uh, a bunch of you had great suggestions for your dream rigs as well. You all have immaculate taste. I was looking at some of that stuff and just kind of drooling. Uh, this one comes from Brad Butler. I should try out some Grecos if I want to mean Les Paul copy. Uh, I have featured quite a few Grecos on the channel before, actually. I've got a kind of Les Paul custom style one with the dirty fingers in the bridge. If you've seen my John Sykes inspired videos, that's the guitar I'm playing there. I've also got one set up for slides. So I should pull the slide one out and be really terrible at playing slide in a video. <sighs> slide's always one of those things where, you know, I, I will play for an hour and be like, yeah, this is awesome. I know how to play slide. And then I watch Derek Trucks and I'm like, I don't know how to play slide and I put it down. So I think everyone feels like that about Derek though. So yeah, excellent, uh, excellent suggestion there. I agree the Greco stuff is awesome. Let's see, next question. In an alternate universe where I'm a blues dad, uh, what would I be doing for a living? Uh, I, uh, I don't have any kids, so I kind of am disqualified from the dad part of it, but I feel like I'd do that anyway. I would probably be a disgruntled academic. I did a degree in pure mathematics and finished my honors and then just, just left and joined a band and started playing music and here we are. So I imagine that's the point of divergence in my life where now I'm doing this and playing guitars and doing music. Otherwise I would probably be at a university somewhere uh, talking about really obscure stuff rather than talking about obscure ways to get guitar tones. So I'm sure there's a lot of similarities happening there. This one is from Nubasaurus. Shout out to anyone from Perth watching the video. Have I ever played an Ormsby guitar? I have. I've got a couple of videos with some Ormsby guitars on the channel you can check out. I really like their Goliath, their headless guitar, and Perry's finishes are amazing. I've known Perry, <coughs> pardon me, for quite a long time, actually. I remember buying some pickups off him when I was about 18 and driving all the way down to his workshop on like a 40 something degree day wearing a leather jacket and him just being like, dude, you're insane. And then we talked about 80s rock and metal for about three hours. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, shout out to Perry because he's dominating at the moment with his guitars. It's awesome to see. Excellent question. Uh, this one is from Rick Carr. Is my band Ragdoll named after the Aerosmith song Ragdoll? No, we are named after the cat the ragdoll breed. Our drummer Cam had this gorgeous ragdoll cat and uh, it was the first name that we didn't utterly despise so we just stuck with it. And you'll notice that the band name is all one word rather than ragdoll like the Aerosmith song. So that's the giveaway right there. I always enjoy seeing how, uh, you know, back, back in my day when you could go on tour, uh, all those kind of things, seeing how venues would choose to put it as one word, as separate words, rag dolls, red dog was one we got. Uh, that, was a, that was an interesting night. Uh, this one's from Jonathan Marquis. My question for you, can I play a bit of that butterscotch telly? Well, here's one I prepared earlier just for you, Jonathan. <laughs> This 
there's a lot of echo on that patch. Uh, probably not the best demonstration of like the pure tone of this guitar, but I was listening to um, Maggot Brain by Parliament earlier in the day. So lots and lots of echoplex. Awesome, awesome guitar solo, by the way. If you've never heard it, I remember the first time I heard it, it was it was a revelation. So uh, yeah, this, this guitar's fun. I might play it for the rest of the videos. So this one is from Travis Russell who has a Mike Shishkov guitar, which is pretty awesome because I'm, I'm well aware of the Shishkov stuff because his, of his association with Hamer. That's cool. And through a BE100, that's amazing. Alrighty, let's see. Where, where's this? Uh, oh, this is kind of cool. You were drinking your tea and you came across a video that you put up 12 years ago with your 78 Hamer Sunburst and you saw that I had left a comment. That's absolutely wild. Uh, yeah. That would have been right around the time I actually started having a YouTube account. Not that I was making content or being a YouTuber, but uh, yeah, I was probably just checking out videos of old Hamers. That's really, really cool. It's a small, small world, isn't it? So uh, this one is from Guitar6874. Any tricks to improve or enhance the sound of an Axe FX3 through the Gemini 2x12? I have a whole video on uh, FR, FR tricks. I did it with an Atomic CLR, but there's a few little things in there you might find really handy. I would say you can get most of what you need with EQ and either using the global EQ on the axe or using a parametric EQ block in there. So go and check that video out. Uh, let's see, where is the next question? Because I because I asked you all a question, uh, I've got a lot of answers, but um, the the questions are not all in a row. So maybe I should ask you all a question to answer so that I'll get the same thing next week and I'll get used to this. So what I want to know is I want you all to tell me what was the make and model of your first guitar ever. Let me know in the comments and I'll tell you what mine was next week. Uh, in the meantime, let's see. We have one from Ballas Halassi. Uh, what are my input settings on the FM3 Axe FX? I think the input, uh, whatever the adjustment thing is on the front, is at about 20% on my Axe FX3, and I'm probably using the 12 dB pad on the FM3. And what kind of strings do I use? Basically, Elixir 10 to 52 nanowebs on everything, although they're not making them at the moment. Uh, this was the biggest, oh my God, what am I going to do moment? throughout the whole pandemic. Uh, you know, it wasn't toilet paper, it was guitar strings. So I've kind of hoarded a bunch of those luckily. So pretty much just put them on everything. I'm, I'm used to that. Uh, fantastic. So there you go. Uh, this one is from Tim. Let's see, what does he say? He loves his katana, that's awesome. And he had one of those customs back in the day. I think we had the same custom style amp, Tim. That's kind of cool. Alrighty, this one is from Konstantinos. I always like seeing questions from you because you always kind of ask something interesting. And this week you have asked this. Uh, do I think the FRFR branded speakers for guitarists are any different, better than a regular PA monitor speaker? Uh, I think some of them just are rebranded monitor speakers. Uh, however, I think stuff like the, you know, the Atomic CLR or the Gemini, they really do seem to be designed and built for use with a modeler, which is kind of interesting. Some of the, uh, what was it? Is it the Alto TS-10 or something like that? I feel like that got rebranded. That's like just the head rush speaker or something like that. Could be to talking totally out of turn here. So uh, yeah, but some of them definitely sound a lot more like PA speakers as well. So uh, yeah, good question. That that I'm sure there's actually someone who knows what's up who can answer that question. So if that person wants to leave a comment, by all means, do that. This one is from uh, Tim again. What amps on the Ragdoll song break you? It is a Marshall DSL 50 and a Jet City JCA 50H on that track. Uh, one set of doubles was with a uh, Sunburst Les Paul, the one somewhere back there. And then the other tracks were with my buddy Phil's Jeff Beck Custom Shop Strat, which is an amazing guitar. I use that guitar a whole bunch on the whole All I Want Is Everything EP, uh, which is kind of cool because I've seen a few people have got that tattooed on them, which is kind of wild. Like <laughs> I wrote a song that somebody's tattooed the title of them onto themselves. That's, that's commitment right there. Alrighty. 
One of my thoughts on the Quad Cortex or the Headrush pedal board, I haven't really spent time with either of them, although I see the Quad Cortex is out and shout out to John Cordy for all his Quad Cortex stuff. It's pretty amazing that he's been able to create so much more content than all the official videos have. Uh, he's an incredible player and a great teacher as well, obviously. So I've uh, watched a bunch of his stuff and sounds really good. Sounds like John. Uh, the head rush, I haven't tried too much. I think I said last week, uh, one of my students has a head rush and I played with it for about 10 minutes. So uh, definitely want to try both on the channel at some point because uh, lots of people use them, lots of people like them. They make Guitar sound good. That's what we're all here for. Uh, speaking of guitar sounding good, uh, let's hear the neck pickup with this uh, Echoplex style preset. <laughs> Next question is from Juan Salazar. How reliable are the PRS trems? I think they're pretty fantastic, although my guitars with trems I've got blocked, so I'm not really the guy to talk about them, but I did borrow a DGT recently, and the trem on that was just amazing. I think they're a very well-designed system on there. Same goes for their non-adjustable wraparound tailpiece. I've got that on my Mira Makati and SC245. And I love that thing. Uh, of course, if you really want fine granular control, if you want to go up to 12s or something like that, you might want to get one of those adjustable bridges. But uh, yeah, I think they're awesome. Like all the PRS hardware, Paul knows what's up. He really does. So uh, <laughs> this next one is from Nickel Back. I see what you did there. Uh, did I watch Steve Irwin when I was younger? Yeah. Lots. I remember the day he died as well. Uh, I really distinctly remember that and it felt surreal. It was like uh, when Dimebag died as well. It was one of those things where I, I was just like, well, this obviously is a mistake because this just couldn't happen. So, yeah, I remember a lot of people. I was at school that day and, yeah, just people being shocked and saddened. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of nice to see his family have just kind of continued doing what he was doing. So, yeah, I miss Steve. I, uh, you know, I kind of feel like we, we could all do with a bit of Steve Irwin in our lives right now. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, next question from John Smith. Uh, to John's ears, the Kemper sounds more authentic and real than the Axe FX and especially the Helix. Uh, he mentions that he likes the Top Jimmy EVH Brown sound profiles. I agree, they sound amazing. Uh, your question though, John, is how come I didn't go down the Kemper road? Uh, I just didn't really try one before I tried the Axe FX. I did try a Helix before I got my first Axe FX and I ended up liking the Axe more. So I don't know, maybe in a parallel universe, I tried a Kemper first and really, really liked it and got one. So I just got the first thing that worked. And I got to say, I really did enjoy the Kemper the couple of times I've borrowed one. And I totally understand why people dig it. and. That's all that really matters. If you dig your guitar sound and it works for you, whether it's an amp or a Kemper or a Helix or a Quad Cortex, you know, good for you. Good for you. Go and enjoy it. You know, it's uh, you don't have to enjoying something and converting people. I'm not saying this is what you're trying to do, by the way, John, but there's a lot of that discourse on uh, the Internet with guitar stuff where it's like, which modeler is the best? Uh, probably the best modeler is the one that you're using right now and you're doing gigs with. Same with amps, like what amp is the best? I don't know, the one you're playing guitar through, that's the point, to play guitar, to play music. So uh, yeah, the Kemper, I will say the workflow because I'm so used to the granular control you have on the Axe FX was very different. Uh, I like the fact that on the Axe, if you bring up a Boogie Mark series model, the tone stack is pre-gain and the graphic EQ is post-gain, so it's kind of like that. And uh, yeah, I'm just it's just the tool that suits me the most. So if the Kemper suits you, uh, that's awesome. It, it almost feels like if we were arguing about different types of screwdrivers on the internet as guitar players, you know, that would seem ridiculous from the outside looking in. But 
Uh, that's what a lot of people do. So I'm stoked that you really like the Kemper. Uh, this one is from Andrew Carney, who saw my Sabotage 5 Best Riffs. Can I make a preset based on Chris Oliva's guitar tone? I want to get around to that at some point. A lot of people have written to me about that. And uh, shout out to the man himself, John Oliva, who wrote to me. And that, I just have to say, blew my mind. It's one of the coolest things that's you know happened to me through the whole YouTube thing. Uh, because Sabotage's music changed my life. I don't think I would be playing rock guitar if it wasn't for hearing Edge of Thorns blaring out of uh, my dad's shed on a compilation CD. And then I went and bought all their stuff when I could find it and uh, fell in love with the music, fell in love with TSO, everybody associated with that. Uh, one of the best shows I've ever seen live was TSO when I was in Dallas in 2016. And one of the best live guitar solos I've seen uh, was Angus Clark's solo where he goes out in there. So shout out to Angus, awesome dude. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really humbling to hear that from people who like that music as much as I do. So uh, just trying to spread the love because Chris was a great guitar player and a really important guitar player for me as well. So the influence runs deep right there. We got time for few more questions. Uh, this one is from Tom Rogers, uh, talking about the full thickness ESP LTD in comparison with the PRS stuff. I did a like SC245 Les Paul comparison. That would be an interesting one to get an eclipse into the mix because that's kind of the other, uh, you know, widely available single cut guitar, I think. Every time I've played an ESP eclipse, I've been really, really impressed with just like, how easy it is to play, you know? Uh, the PRS stuff is easy to play, so is the ESP stuff. Uh, I think every single one I've played has had EMGs in it, uh, which is not a diss on EMGs. I think EMGs are totally fine, but I would love to hear one with some like vintage output pickups in it or something like that. So, uh, and the last one from Ben Peasley. Uh, I think this is the last question. It is, we're coming to the end. I'm feeling a bit morose. Uh, I'm gonna to have to go and play some guitar or something terrible like that after I finish this. So uh, how do you justify buying new gear to your wife? Whew. Uh, let's expand this question. How would anybody explain uh, or justify buying new gear to their significant other? And again, I'm gonna to revert to that screwdriver question. You know, uh, if you really need the brand new screwdriver because you have a job to do with it, uh, I think that's the justification in itself. If you just really like collecting screwdrivers and that's something that you do, that's also kind of a justification in itself. Do you need 10 of the same screwdriver? Ask yourself that question and the answer is in there. And I will say farewell to you all for this week. If you've got questions for next week, chuck it in the comments below and uh, I'm gonna play some more. Uh, let's do the middle pickup selection here on the telly for this with uh, some uh, crazy Echoplex stuff. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and be good to one another.